Welcome to Tangential Soup, a weekly podcast discussing life in Australia, technology, food, fitness, and the like, hosted by myself, David Caddy, Melbourneian, independent developer, and tea enthusiast, as well as my good childhood friend, Alexander Carr, Sydney cider, slave to the man, karate practitioner, and lover of adventure. This week, we talk about marriage equality, new announcements from Tesla, and camping. But before all that, we've got some follow-up about the number of shares in a company. This is something we've touched on a few times, Alex, without real resolution, but uh, you've actually figured it out, have you? Um, well, look, I wouldn't say that I figured it out in full. Um, and yes, we certainly have touched on it a couple of times. And the reason we don't have any resolution is I keep forgetting to uh, look it up. <laughs> but I have, now, I have now done a bit of research. Um, and what I found is that the number of shares a company issues is, is actually set by the company. And there's no specific number. Um, one side I was reading suggested that uh, companies usually issue about 10 million shares to start off with and then, and then go from there. Um, but really, it can be any number. And the reason it interested me was because you look at the, the share prices of the Australian stocks versus the share prices of some of the American stocks, and there's a huge discrepancy. Like some of the, the bigger players in Australia, are obviously the banks and the miners, and they have share prices around 60 to $80 per share, as opposed to a company that we talk about a lot like Tesla which has a share price of about $350 or there around. Mm. Um, and, you know, I wonder, is it just because the companies in America are better? Um, but just to give you one comparison that I, that I found, um, Tesla has issued... Um, now, now, the measurement that I could find was the shares outstanding, and I think that means that shares that aren't actually owned and disclosed by the company, because that's really the only share disclosure that comes about, apart from other major owners which are usually disclosed in the company's annual reports. So shares outstanding would mean shares that are issued to private sellers such as you sorry, to private buyers such as you or me, but obviously aren't disclosed by the company because they've they've been put out there and you know we don't have a duty to disclose that we own X amount of this company's shares. Um, and the shares outstanding for a company like BHP are about two point six billion. Okay. As opposed to shares outstanding, and their share, current share price is at $42. Um, as opposed to the shares outstanding for a company like Tesla, which are about $166 million. So it's possible that Australian companies just issue, or the, the larger Australian companies at least, just issue a few more shares than the American companies. And that is why their share prices are lower, because obviously there's, each share owned is a smaller percentage of the company itself. Right, okay. So they all start at that 10 million number roughly, but they don't all make them available sort of straight away kind of thing. Well, that that seems to be it, yeah. And as I said, like a company can issue as many shares as it wants, it seems. It's just they uh, obviously they don't want to be issuing shares because it, it means that their current shareholders are going to be losing value. And really what a lot of companies focus on nowadays, almost all companies focus on nowadays, if they're listed, They've got to try and create value for their shareholders, which means driving their share price up or having paying good dividends on their shares, mm. which is uh, which is interesting because if you look at a company like uh, Telstra, which I, I didn't actually look at the number of shares they have issued, but I know that their share price is really bad. Like the share price is around three dollars. Mm. Um, and for our listeners who don't know, Telstra is the biggest telco in Australia, equivalent to AT and T in the states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, their share price is historically just performed horribly. I think maybe it would have gotten up to about $10 or so uh, at one point. They became publicly listed in the early 2000s um, after they were a uh, government-owned company. Uh, they became publicly uh, listed and their share price has just basically gone downhill since there. It's a, uh, it's a bit sad if you did own Telstra shares. Um, however, I don't know. I'm kind of of the opinion that they might bounce back at some point. So maybe now's the time to buy now that they've kind of hit their bottom as it were. Although they're still going down because uh, Telstra have just decided that they're not going to pay dividends as big as they were on their shares and they're going to try and drive the share price up a bit. But in the short term, that's actually driven the share price down. Okay. Yeah, well, I don't know. Like Now that they don't sort of have control of the whole 
Well, the old copper network has been superseded by the MBN, the uh, new fiber yep. system that we have. So they don't have control of that really anymore. So now their only advantage is sort of in the cell coverage, but that's slowly, slowly sort of being eaten away. Not rapidly, but the Optus network is still not bad. You're on Optus, aren't you? Um, I am on Optus. And I've got to say, actually, I don't find the Optus network amazing around where I live because on the train line, you know, I, I live in the inner part of the Sydney city, so I would expect it to have cell coverage. But uh, on the train line, I basically get no cell coverage the entire way into work. Mm. Um, and I, I don't know if maybe that's something interfering with it, but... The funny thing is, I used to be with uh, the Aldi cell phone um, network, uh, which is a second tier Optus network, I've been told. And I used to get coverage on the on the train line then, and it used to be fine. And I actually switched to Telstra because it's a bit slow. The, the uh, Aldi network was a bit slow in parts. Um, sorry, I switched to Optus rather. And um, I thought that that would improve it, but it's actually made the coverage a bit worse, but it is faster where I do get coverage. I guess you win some, lose some. I could have sworn that Aldi was a Telstra network. They may be Telstra network, and that would probably explain why. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Telstra are trying to do a lot of things in the IoT space. I know, not that they've come out with too many products, but they're really going hard and in investing in things like uh, a vehicle to pedestrian monitoring and uh, other IoT sort of smart whatever, smart home things. Yeah, okay. Well, so, I mean, it makes sense. They've got to do something, right? Because basically their existing network, which is very large, but it's just being chipped away by the smaller, cheaper telcos, who, who in a lot of cases offer a very similar product to Telstra. Yes. Discounted price. Although recently, Telstra prices have now gotten a lot more competitive, probably because they've, their advantages are being eaten away. Yeah. Yeah. They do try to, to advertise themselves as being a premier network and I think that's that's what they say. But um on my time with Telstra, so I was with Telstra before I was with Aldi. Um I didn't I didn't really find that their coverage was amazing. You know, it was it was better than it was than it is with um my current providers, but uh you know, I live in the inner city, apart from not getting coverage on the train line, which I find a bit ridiculous, I get coverage everywhere else, so I really don't have to worry about it. How's your uh, stock market game going? Is it almost at the end of the season or whatever? It's actually over. Ah, um, did you win? So <laughs> I did win. I, I won purely because I bought uh, Oracobra right before it had a huge spike in, in prices. I um, So I made a $14,000 investment on it. And I think over the course of about two weeks, I made another $5,000 on that. Oh, nice. Um, and it was purely for that reason that I won. It was about half... Well, slightly less than half of my total uh, earnings over the game. So it went from uh, mid-August to mid-November, so a period of uh, three months. And um, I made, uh, on a $50,000 investment, I made $62,500. Well, that's all right. Um, and I was I was playing against a, a friend at work, and he, he usually does better than me um, in, in these games. He just, I don't know, he just tends to buy a lot better stock somehow. And he was ahead of me for the entire game, right up until probably the last week. And then I got ahead of him and I just managed to stay ahead of him. So he would have finished on about 61000 Oh, comeback of the century. Yes, right. I was actually about $2,000 behind him consistently the entire way. And then I, uh, I ended up winning it. Nice. Perhaps we could, we could play for the podcast next time and see, who, see how we go. Yes, absolutely. Although I dare say you'll... Uh... Smoke me. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't really know a whole lot about the stock market, but I've kind of come to realize that a lot of people don't really understand a lot of things. I mean, you can have a basic understanding of whatever you're buying, whether it's shares or there are a lot of other things you can buy on the markets. Like you can buy stocks on artificial markets. You can you can kind of buy options against stocks so you can bet on whether the stock's going to go up or down. But really, like, it's all its all a big gamble. And some people are obviously better gamblers than others. And obviously, the, the better you understand the market and the companies you're buying, the, the better chance you, you'll have of getting it right. But in the end, it is all a giant gamble. And a lot of the time, it doesn't doesn't pay off for people. You've just got to hope that the time it does pay off you it's, makes more money than the times it doesn't. That's true. I think the advantage you'd have, though, is a lot of the companies that I have a fair grasp on are all American companies. 
So for this ASX five hundred, I yeah. don't know. Oh, it's actually the two hundred. Oh, two hundred. Yeah. I gotta say, I don't really understand these companies either, though. But I just, I so the way I do it, I just, I just tend to watch the companies that have been short sold <laughs> a lot, and then go for those ones because you know they're gonna have peaks and troughs. Hmm. I guess that's one way of doing it. Did that technology one one do any good in the end? Um, what did you get I out of them? I, I got out of them, but I think they ended up making a little bit of money. Um, I really need to look up what they do exactly. Yeah, I think I ended up getting. Oh, I think I got a few hundred dollars out of them in the end. I think, and then I sold them. So it was really just on the back of all these lithium miners. It was actually basically exclusively on the miners themselves because the miners are uh, so volatile that we go technology one. So I've downloaded an application on my phone uh, called Investing dot com, um, and it's got really good information. Like it's got really good, easy to access information on uh, on all the companies on. Well, basically on the various exchanges. Okay. And if I ever need to see like the share price of a company or anything like that, it's got really easy to access graphs. Um, and it seems to me like a pretty, pretty good uh, app in general, as far as these things go. I have to check it out. I'll put a link in the show notes for anyone else that's interested. Yeah. I was also talking to somebody at work about uh, investing and. In- he said that he's made a lot of money and lost a lot of money, but he uh, invests in cryptocurrencies. Oh yeah, which we have we've talked about, I think, a bit on the show before. Um, like but Bitcoin, but other ones. Bitcoin, and uh, he's investing in Bitcoin, but also all the other. There are so many cryptocurrencies out there at the moment. Um, I know it's ridiculous. And I, I fully, sh- I fully share what you're saying, David. It's a, it's a huge bubble, and people are going to lose a lot of money on these cryptocurrencies. Um, because do do you know what the main thing that gets me though is? What's that? At the moment, I know you can use cryptocurrencies and they're primarily almost exclusively used online. Um, but at the moment, you know, if you go out to buy a cup of coffee, you can't use a cryptocurrency. If you want to buy a fridge, you probably can't use a cryptocurrency. You know, for everyday things that you, you do apart from, you know, online transactions, or if you want to go on the dark web and buy some drugs, which is... A lot of what uh, cryptocurrencies are used for nowadays. Um, you know, unless you want to do these things, you can't use cryptocurrency. So people are speculating that, you know, with probably with some degree of good reason, that cryptocurrencies will become valuable because as long as they have a reliable system behind them, they're, um, they're going to be widely used over the internet at some point. But does it justify the cost of a single Bitcoin being above $10,000? I don't think so. I don't think it is ever going to be worth that much well yeah i don't know but uh like a lot of big financial institutions have backed bitcoin now so although you can't go buy things directly with them i think that will come in the not too distant future with bitcoin specifically it's all these hundreds if not thousands of other ones that i think some might make it and then some will just die off completely and it's really hard to know which is going to be which kind of thing well, yeah, I suppose it will. Because they can't all survive. It's just not possible. No. Um, yeah, well, I suppose a uh, a currency for the entire world. But uh, the, the the governments, I don't think, would particularly enjoy having a uh, a decentralized currency that they can't really control. No. That, and I know that, that uh, China's already banned trading of Bitcoin. Well, yeah, there'll be some that are pretty slow to come on board, I suppose. But if you have some big banks, which there have been quite a few big banks that said, you know, okay, we actually deal in Bitcoin now, that, you know, that it sort of starts to override governments almost if you've got big financial institutions, unless they actually outright ban it like China have. Well, when they say that they're dealing in Bitcoin, does that mean that they've started trading Bitcoin though? Because I think trading something and uh, actually accepting it as a currency are two different things. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Because I don't think it's hard to deny that there is a lot of money to be made on Bitcoin. If you're buying and selling right, you could you could be making quite a bit of dosh on it. But mm. that's different to actually using it as a currency, which I don't think it's being very widely used as at the moment, apart from, as I said, 
online facilities and a lot of use, I think, in the dark web. And it's been used for, on the dark web for quite a while, though, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's, people love it for that sort of thing. And also as well, you're betting the, the cost of Bitcoin against the cost of, you know, currencies in a certain country as well, which I think is a, a bit funny. So another piece of exciting news was the uh, same-sex marriage survey coming back with a reasonably resounding yes vote. I think we we're all expecting that it would be yes, and I'm glad that it came back that way. Uh, yeah. About 62% yes. Yes, no, I agree. I mean, I think we, we both agree that it was a massive waste of time, though. And, that... and money. $120 million or whatever. I kind of feel like it's a, it's a human rights issue. It's not, it's not something that should be put to public opinion. A stupid thing um, too was that the marriage laws in Australia never actually had sex written into them until Johnny Howard in, I think, the mid-90s actually put that in there. So I don't know whether you could actually get married or anyone would have married you as a same-sex couple, but it wasn't strictly against the law before that point. So it's only a fairly recent addition to the law that we're now trying to repeal. <laughs> So it's even more stupid than it it seems on the surface. Yes. Um. And it is a human rights issue. It's like what... And it doesn't really affect anything that much either. Like, unless you're coming at it from a religious standpoint, which I think very few people in Australia are these days, then there's really no argument to be made. No, there there isn't. Um, it's just simply ridiculous that you know we have to have this stupid conversation. Um, but I, I so someone at work, you know, told me quite plainly that she had voted no, um, as as is her right. Well, as is her right under this survey. I don't think that anyone should actually be able to set that right. But Is she of the older generation or the younger generation? Older generation, so she would have been about forty or so. Um, she told me the reason is, you know, de facto couples have the same have the same rights that uh, married couples do, but they don't. Um, I think under Australian law they might, but Australian law doesn't encompass everything that kind of the, all the rights that you might have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, and a very good example of this is I remember reading a story of a um, a couple whose parents didn't want them to marry. Um, because they were, oh, sorry, didn't want them to be together because they were, they were gay. Um, and one of these people actually ended up, um, or the, the side with the parents who didn't agree with, uh, with their relationship, um, ended up in hospital, um, basically dying of a car accident or something, something to that effect. And, um, the parents actually, because of the laws that the hospital or the rules that the hospital had in place, the parents actually had the decision of who could visit this person in hospital because this person was, was unconscious. Um, and it actually resulted in the, the person dying, you know, without ever waking up from their coma and their partner not being able to see them. Oh, well, um, yeah. Which is terrible. So, you know, it may be the case that, that the law of Australia says that de facto couples have the same rights, but, uh, you know, they don't in all situations, obviously. Mm. Yeah, they will. That, that's a good point. Although I would say kind of also... Even if they did have exactly the same rights, to me that's almost more of an argument to say, well, then why the hell not? Why can't they get married? At that point, it's basically a label, you yeah. Know? And you're just you're just unnecessarily rejecting people from that, yeah, yeah, for no reason, yeah. And the fact of the matter is, like, people can say that marriage is a religious ceremony, which you know is what it, it used to be, as. yeah. But it, it hasn't been a religious ceremony for so long no. because it's had so many, you know, legal implications attached to it. That um... Exactly. And back in the day, it was to force people to stay together, you know, and they have children and things. So then it wasn't other people's problems. Yes. And nowadays, you know, so many people get divorced left, right and centre that the mean- that meaning has also sort of drifted away. So Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I feel like the meaning of marriage has been diluted. But then, you know, when it comes to these sorts of things, people are so vehement, well, some people, and I don't really understand it at all. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think that because we've, we've let marriage have all these, uh, these legal and social connotations that it, it didn't have before, um, 
and the fact that you can get married without it having without being you know it being part of a religious event yes you need to uh you need to take the the consideration of religious out, religion out of it entirely you do you do which you know everything's better without religion <laughs> um, for the most part yeah i think so you know, pretty religion much had its purpose back in the day but uh... yes i there's some community aspects i could argue that are positive but there's not too much else no i, I would agree with that mm. Something I would I would like to discuss at some point, um, which very directly relates to this, is the allocation of public money to things like this. Um, I feel that obviously we've elected these people to be responsible for it, but they don't actually really seem to be responsible for the bad choices that they make to a very large degree. And what I mean is, why why is it the case that people are allowed to, in my opinion, waste money on this? A because There are other ways of gathering this data that didn't require an expensive postal survey. Absolutely. And B, it was was a kind of a survey that was very much just designed to appease a select few people. And it didn't didn't really have any... It doesn't have any legal grounds. Um, And... Yeah, it's non-binding, no legal grounds, expensive... Like it wasn't mandatory to vote, so yeah. Exactly. What was the percentage that people voted? Oh, I don't actually know what it was, to be honest. It's like sixty, seventy percent, or something. But a fair chunk didn't vote, which you know, I guess is their right too. But it's sort of not a proper when you're spending that much on a survey. I don't know. It's you're right though. Didn't it come out of some sort of emergency fund or something that had to get approved by the high court? Um. I don't actually know how it was paid for. There was some fund that was meant to be used for only special circumstances, and they argued that this was special enough, and then some other body had to approve that, and they did. So there is like another body holding the government in check for these sorts of things, but they said it was okay. And I don't necessarily know how that got through, because a lot of the media was speculating that it wouldn't get through that, that process. So I remember seeing at the time um, there were a lot of uh, politicians talking about it, but they were just talking about, um, I guess, making the decision to to put forward the request to use the funds. Um, so I don't think it was a political body that decided it. So mm. I suppose it must have been a legal one in some way. I guess it's it's difficult and, um, you know, it's it's not just one person's decision to do these things. I mean, obviously Malcolm Turnbull is our PM, as he is. Um, so in some way, I think it might be fair to hold him accountable. But, I mean, in the end, he's really just sitting there at the whim of his political party and, I guess, the various people that pay his salary. For something like this, though, it's sort of like... It's an absolutely huge issue for the people that it affects. But changing the law is not going to have any negative repercussions on anyone, right? No. Um, And to spend... And and we already kind of knew what the result would be. I think everyone was very confident it was going to be yes because of other polls that have been done, other surveys that have been done. The fact that Australia is less and less religious is another factor as well. Yep. I mean, yeah, even, even if you look at the support across other nations that are probably more religious than us and have, you know, probably more of those grounds to reject it, they're saying yes to it too now. So, I mean, we could safely say that it was going to be yes. They didn't want to pull the trigger on it because it's still a fairly controversial issue. So they come up with this airy-fairy kind of thing to show that they're trying to do something about it without actually committing to it. $122 million of the taxpayers' money put into having the servo circulated, which is non-binding. Yes. And so if you look at the whole thing from start to finish, it was just a, designed as either a delay tactic, if we were confident of the thing, or else, you know, if it did somehow miraculously come back, no, then that would just shut down the whole argument and they wouldn't talk about it again for probably until the next election. And it's just a joke, really. Yeah, exactly. If this was a super, you know... If this had an impact on everyone's life kind of thing. Yeah. 
then maybe you could justify a survey, maybe. But for something like this, which is, in my mind, very clear-cut, and I think a lot of people's mind, very clear-cut, um, just just do the thing, you know. At least put it to maybe a vote internally, like one of those things where, you know, inside the government, or a conscious vote or something. Because, you know, we do have the parties, you know, the electives representing their seats and things. Why couldn't they have done that sort of thing first? Yeah. No, I, I agree with that, actually. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and it's kind of what you're saying about how it doesn't affect a lot of people. You're right. But we're asking the people, really, the majority of people are not affected by it. But we're asking the majority of people what they think about it. Yes. Which is a very strange way to approach the situation. Well, that's it? also true, right? Yeah. Whether whether a same-sex couple gets married and you're not same-sex, it has no bearing on your life whatsoever. And you might not like it, but... No. There are a lot of things that I don't like, but I don't think that I should necessarily have a say on whether they... But it's not going to negatively impact you. It's not like someone's building a high-rise next to your house or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, that's exactly it. Mm. <laughs> but for those people, it does impact their lives, like you were saying with that example in the hospital like yeah it doesn't make any sense why you would not let them get married and we just go through this whole rigmarole hopefully hopefully this will drive the situation forward but i don't understand why we had to go through this process in the first place to be honest no uh, i mean the reason we had to go through this process in the first place was because i don't think that anyone wanted to make the tough decision even though they knew it had to be made yeah, but how tough of a decision is it? I just don't understand where, you know, the whole world is coming to this realisation, really. At least, you know, the developed Western nations. Mm. It's clearly going this way, like you say. If it's not this year, it's next year. If it's not next year, it's the year after. We're going to get there. So just, yes. you know, why not embrace it and be the one that made the change and be, you know, somewhat a hero to these people and, you know, Go down in history, probably, as opposed to, eh, nah, I don't know, maybe. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I, I completely get what you're saying. But I, I think it comes down to what we have in politics at the moment, where we have politicians that want to stay in power as opposed to politicians who want to make the hard choices. Not even that want to make the hard choices, but are willing to make the hard choices. Yeah, but now we clearly know that it, the majority are in favour of this. How yeah. hard of a choice is it, really? You see, the thing is, when you've got... I'm more talking about how it's a hard choice for Malcolm Turnbull because his party is primarily conservatives and his his electorate are primarily conservatives. Yeah. Like these are people that don't want it to happen. So it's not a hard choice for you or I. Um, And I mean, like, in the end, it's not really a hard choice for him or me, there is it. But But even it's a hard choice in the sense that it's going to it's going to affect his his um, yeah popularity. I know, no one wants to do anything because it'll aggravate someone. But yeah, yeah. it is unfortunate. You're right. We're, we're at this point in politics where everyone's just petrified. They'll yell at yeah. each other backwards and forwards until they're blue in the face and do nothing. Yeah, exactly. Sad, I mean, sad state of affairs. Exactly what we're facing now. Unlike Tesla, who are actually going forward and doing a whole lot of interesting things. Yes, exactly, they are. Did you, uh, I know you're very interested in the semi-truck that they're coming out with. Now there's a lot more details they announced the other day. I am actually very interested. Um, I mean, if they can get a fleet of these on the road, um, they're going to be miles ahead of their competition. And And if what they're saying in terms of the economics working out to an advantage over regular diesel trucks, then I imagine many companies are going to be looking very seriously at it. Oh, absolutely. It's going to be ridiculously far above the uh, the competition. And yeah, they're going to be they're going to be in a situation where they could potentially dominate a section of the market that I mean, I wouldn't have really considered that Tesla would start going to trucks. I mean, now that you look at it, it seems like an obvious decision, but Yeah, I well, I mean, these are only going to be available in 2019. They're so a little ways out. But I probably would have questioned whether electric vehicles had the, uh, I guess, pulling capacity to 
get to this level so quickly kind of thing, but uh, they've made it happen. And I was surprised well, about the speed supposedly. improvements too. <laughs> well, supposedly, yeah, but Tesla don't... I mean, I, we've talked about before how uh, Elon likes to hype things up a little bit, but they never, like, vastly exaggerate the truth. So if they're saying this, it must be at least in the ballpark. Oh, I'm sure it is. I mean, really, you can't go around lying. And all the stats they had were, weird. like, a truck with a single trailer loaded to the maximum capacity for U.S. roads. And they were saying that, you know, it could accelerate faster, it would uh, go faster on uh, inclines. And I, what I didn't know that he talked about in that video of the presentation was to fill up a regular diesel truck can take up to 15 minutes with just diesel fuel. And so when he's talking about recharging the truck, you can do it in about half an hour for 400 miles range yeah and you can do that at your loading dock and i thought well that is actually genius isn't it you don't have to well they probably have their own petrol stations and that at the depot as well but if you're there probably unloading for i would say that length of time then that sort of becomes a non-issue and they're guaranteeing for how many miles was it how many hundred miles uh, so the car is going to be guaranteed for a mil- sorry the truck is going to be guaranteed for a million miles. A million miles, yeah. Yep. Um, they're guaranteeing that, and uh, I mean it looks kind of futuristic as well. So I'm sure there's going to be a few trucking companies that uh, want the first batch. Well, I mean if 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 what he's saying is true, if you're purchasing new trucks, it would be stupid not to get a Tesla because it's going to fit in about the ballpark. It's going to perform a lot more efficiently. And they're going to start at a at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars US, which apparently is just a little bit more expensive than a diesel truck, about one hundred and twenty thousand. So yeah, it's in the ballpark, and it's efficiency wise should be uh, much. Oh, and they're also guaranteeing the price of electricity for the first however long. Oh really? Yeah, that's a clever idea. So you're right. If they can, uh, I think this is a great. Great move by Tesla, and uh, this is where the future of things are going. And they talked about the safety features, and you know, if you have a medical emergency in the cab, that it will stay in the lane and slowly come to a stop. You yes. hear a lot about these huge accidents with trucks; like it should minimise that, if not reduce it entirely. Um, there's just so many advantages, really. I thought it was interesting too that it's uh, just got the single seat in the cab. Well, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, you might sometimes need to transport an extra person in a uh, in a truck, but presumably not too often. It also eliminates the need to have two different models for right-hand and left-hand drive. It does. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a clever, I, I didn't actually think of that, to be honest. So presumably Australians can get it at the same time as everyone else. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And they genius. also announced the Roadster 2. Yeah. Um, I've got to admit, I don't know what the Roadster 1 looks like. Um, the Roadster 1 was like their first ever car, basically, and they partnered with another manufacturer I can't remember the name of. And they sort of did some of the internals and the drive housing, but it was sort of shoved into a body that was kind of already existing with some minor stylistic differences. So if you look at it, It looks cool, but not 100% like a Tesla. But they did use some of the styling in this new one. Um, So it kind of harkens back to that, but then it does also look a lot more like a Tesla vehicle. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah. So it was kind of an odd one in their history, but this is, I guess, the original vision of the Roadster, I imagine. Yeah. Expensive car, but impressive by the numbers. Well, um... Yeah, from what you were saying, it's going to be the fastest production car, from what they're saying, rather, the fastest production car ever. Mm -hmm. In a straight line, uh, 0 to 60 in 1.9 seconds. Oh, that was another thing that impressed me about the the Tesla truck, though. 0 to 60 in 5 seconds. Yeah, I love the graph that he showed, and he's got the regular diesel truck underneath, and he's like, that thing on the left that's barely moving, that's a regular diesel truck. (laughs) (laughs) That that is so impressive though for a truck because they just move so slowly. They do, yeah. Off the mark, the acceleration like that actually probably is a decent advantage if you're going through built-up areas and you're constantly stopping at intersections and things. 
I wonder. I'm sure they have done some uh, done some projections on how how much it would reduce travel time. Because I mean, really, if you're a truck driver or a truck company or anything like that, the, the distance between destinations is a very important factor to take into account, mm. and it's going to really cut into your bottom line if you're taking longer between to go from A to B. So if they can reduce that, it's amazing. Also, even just like pulling into intersections and things or sort of on ramps. Yeah. Like you would have to make sure you have a huge gap to get a truck in there. And now to do that safely, you'd probably a much shorter one, you know, you could do if you get used to that vehicle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, exactly. Mm. Another thing is it, uh, it has a, an automatic system to stop the, uh, the trailer jackknifing. Oh, yeah, that's true. We didn't talk about that. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, one of the nurse, worst nightmares for truckers, as Elon said. Yes. <laughs> and it's got independent braking on all the wheels, so it will... Uh, I mean, he said it was impossible. I tend to believe him just about, but I'd say it's, you know... Mostly impossible. Mostly impossible, which is a darn sight better than current trucks. Yeah. Um, have you ever jackknifed a trailer before? I just haven't. I've never car. actually driven with a trailer, to be honest, but I know they're not great. Oh, I have. It's a nightmare because... I think you've got to do the same thing with trucks. Like you've got to actually unhook the trailer and then, you know, like drive the truck out, drive yeah. it back in in a straight line. And if you're in a confined space, which truck drivers often are, like if they're dropping stuff off at a loading dock or anything like that. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's absolutely horrible to uh, to kind of go through that process. Oh dear, yeah. Yes, well... I'd be interested to see what the trucking companies think when they first start getting these out on the road. Well, yeah, I mean, it seems to me like there wouldn't be many disadvantages to uh, to buying them. Um, oh, and the shatterproof glass too? That was interesting. Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from what Elon was saying, uh, and I didn't know this, but if you if you have a crack in your windscreen, you you can't actually drive your truck and you've got to get a new one. Yeah. Um, so this Not is, sure. do you say nuclear blast proof or something? He said something about it being able to survive a nuclear blast, but I'm not really sure. I don't really know what that means, works. but essentially it's a lot tougher than, I guess, whatever normal glass that uh, windshields are made out of. Regular old glass. <laughs> I mean, I know it's not regular glass. It is like laminated because you've got the two sections to make sure that even if it breaks, it doesn't like shatter into the um, driver's face but uh yeah it can crack reasonably easily if you get a stone thrown up yeah yeah okay whereas this one seems like it will do a lot lot better well it seems like they thought of everything which is surprising really that given like you said that trucks are off the road when this happens you wouldn't you would have thought that trucks these days just that one tiny advantage they would have started doing that already but uh well, do you know one thing that occurs to me? We are actually watching basically a sales pitch from Tesla and it's possible the existing trucks, some existing trucks do already have this. True, true. But I imagine if he's saying it, that it still can't be very common. No. Mm. I think that's a fair thing to say. Mm. I, do, um, I do often wonder how much Le, Mr. Uh, Ian is actually involved in... Um, the, the the kind of ideas that sit behind these products. I mean, obviously, he's got the team that kind of does it, but I wonder if he ever comes in and just says, I want this for this particular product. I think he drives the grand vision, and I think he's smart enough to get into some of the details, but at this point, given how many projects he's got on the go, I imagine he doesn't really get bogged down in the details too much. No. Um, but, yeah, he probably, he probably does that. I, he reminds me the personality of Steve Jobs, and there's so many stories of Steve coming in and going, okay, I want this, this, and this kind of thing and make it happen. (laughs) Yeah, so I imagine that does happen from time to time. Thanks again for joining me, Alex. Not a problem, David. Pleasure as always. You can follow and get in touch with us on Twitter at Tangential Soup and you can find this week's show notes with more information about today's topics at tsp.fm slash 29. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider sharing it with anyone you think might also and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye. Ciao. Sykes, a couple of weeks ago you went camping somewhere. 
I did. Uh, Jarvis Bay. Jarvis oh, Bay. That's Jesus right. Christ. Yeah. I made a joke about Iron Man. <laughs> Good joke too. Yes. Um, yeah, it was it was very cool. When was the last time you went camping before then? Oh, years ago. Um, probably was... upwards of seven years, maybe. I was going to say, it must have been a while. So what prompted this trip? Um, just went for, with some people from work, just had a nice, uh, a nice relaxing time. Um, kind of been talking about getting out of the city as, I was, as I'm sure you appreciate. Well, you probably wouldn't have quite this problem because you go back to, uh, uh, yes, Castlemaine a fair bit. Castlemaine. Yeah. Where, where we both grew up and in the country, I mean, relatively I do, speaking. Uh, well, yeah, as far as these things go, very close to a lot of trees. Yes. You know, <laughs> good way to measure it. Um, yeah, it, it was nice to be out uh, out among among nature. Um, one of the person I went with got bitten by a possum. A possum. Possum. Well, I mean, he tried to pat the possum. I was going to say, surely, <laughs> must have been he wasn't, too close. He to wasn't him. randomly attacked. <laughs> Dropped um, out of a tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and I went. I went swimming in the water there, and there were actually a lot of uh, blue bottle jellyfish, um, which. I don't know if I've ever been stung by one. I have come out of the water once, and I had and I, I had a tentacle of some sort wrapped around my leg at some point when I was in there, because I just came up with this huge line of welts kind of around my around my leg. But I, I don't know what variety of jellyfish it was. Um, apparently, and it, it stung like it hurt a lot when it happened. Um, and apparently, blue bottles have the same the same effect. So I was kind of swimming, and they were floating in the water around me, and I thought oh, this probably isn't for me. So. I ended up, uh, I ended up giving up on it. But <laughs> quick five minute swim, yeah, with exactly. the jellyfish, with the jellyfish, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, overall, it was, it was really nice to get back in touch with my naturey roots. So you were, were you actually camping with tents and all that? that no, it was, a, it was a it was a cabin in a okay. in a uh, camping type area. So I mean, we had a fire and all that. Fancy stuff, but there was no toast some marshmallows. We kept meaning to buy marshmallows and kept forgetting. So <laughs> no, but that was part of the plan. Just never happened. Oh well, next time. Next time, exactly. <laughs> so it was driven mostly by other people, and you went, "Oh yeah, that sounds fun." Um, yeah, well, the idea behind camping, yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. It was other people's idea. Having said that, enjoyed it a lot. And uh, did you ride up on your bike? Uh, no, I did not ride up on my bike. No. Um, I don't know if I'd be quite comfortable again, just taking the, the highways that were on the way there. So uh, probably would have been a bit confronting for me still. Having said that, I think I'm almost at that stage. Like I rode into the city for the first time the other week. Oh yeah. So, um, yeah, getting there. Was that just to go to work or just as a fun thing to do? Uh, no, it was actually to visit Samantha. Okay. So, uh, I went in and parked my bike in the, uh, in the, in the parking lot around her place. Um, but yeah, I, f- I figured out you can kind of you can be a bit of a jerk when you drive when you drive on your bike without without actually annoying anyone too much because I kind of I was in the wrong lane a couple of times. I thought, okay, well I can quite easily merge, and because the traffic's moving really slowly, and you're in a bike, you don't have to worry about a car sized spot to fit in. You just have to worry about a bike sized spot to fit in, and they're actually a lot easier to find. So I can kind of zip in between cars when they're still moving and uh, just generally get where I'm going a lot quicker. Yeah. Well, yeah, I see them do that from time to time. It does look like, you know, the rest of the traffic's basically standing still and they're just sort of weaving in and out a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's good fun. I uh, very much enjoy it. I also saw Samantha and you have put up a new Instagram account. Yes, correct. Um, so it's called The Broke Barrel. That is a good name too, by the way. Oh, I think, well, Samantha thought of it actually. <laughs> we buy a lot of alcohol at this place called the Oak Barrel, so I think part of the inspiration was drawn <laughs> from there. Yes. Um, but basically, it's just all the uh, the the wine and beer that we're trying because uh, I've started getting into craft beer quite a bit, uh, as, as I've mentioned previously. And uh, you know, we had our trip to Hunter Valley, so we bought a lot of wine and uh, yeah, just just generally enjoying some nice alcohol, um, which is which is a far sight from where I've been on uh in regards to alcohol for most of my life i just tend to buy the cheapest stuff and drink it 
which is, you know, it is what it is, but it's probably not the best way to uh, to enjoy a nice drink, and I'm certainly beginning to appreciate that now. Some of those artisan ones, like you've said before, do have some amazing uh, bottles and cans, don't they? Oh, they do, yeah. The artwork. Actually, it's actually one of the nicer parts of, uh, of drinking them. It's, you know, you get a, a nice fancy can for each, for each different one. Well, they cost a lot more, as you will see if you, you check out the Instagram. Yes, yes. I'll have a link in the show notes for anyone that wants to check that out. It, uh, yeah, it can taste terrible, but if it looks pretty, you know, that's half the experience. Well, it is half the experience, yeah. And I, I actually bought quite an expensive can. I think it was about $11 for a single can. Wow. Um, it was called a garden ale or something like that, which is not something I've ever tried before, but it tasted a bit like medicine to me and I didn't really like it. 